I don't know if you heard that. Mr. Rogers knows my name is what she said at the end. Got to crank those videos up. Mr. Rogers. Scandalous. We had a guy with no shirt on in that video. I already got one complaint. It was me. I love that song. All my life, you have been faithful. The first time I ever heard that song, I just cried. I got to admit, because, I, you know, I don't know about your life, but I can look back and see things that I walked through that I thought, how in the world am I going to make it through this one? And, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I've been in the hospital more than most people just for fun. Uh, in the bed, not visiting people. I've been to visit people too. Yesterday I visited three people in the hospital. Uh, I've been in the hospital so many times that I'm able to give people advice for hospital beds. Like, well, you know, when you're struggling with that, you push that button there and it'll help you and then adjust your feet. Make sure you're moving your feet around. I've got, where's your spirometer? I'm asking questions. And, and then I read, you know, and, and sing, all my life you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so good. You know, and um, to recognize that even in the hardest things, and I, listen, you're people, I've noticed that. And uh, so you've been through hard stuff. And if you haven't yet, <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. Uh, I, you know, it's funny, there's a scene uh, um, in uh, While You Were Sleeping where he, he says, he says, you know, life is really good sometimes. And you have this, this pause between these difficulties of life. And, and, and right now is one of those times. And his son looks at him and goes, Dad, this is not one of those times. And I feel like life sometimes like a roller coaster. Either you're headed down going, ah, or you're going, I'm hearing clicking. What's that? <laughs> clicking. Ah. So anyway, so today we're going to talk about the, the story of the prodigal sons, uh, the prodigal son and the brother. Uh, or the some people call this the loving father. And what's awesome is uh, if Mr. Rogers, he's, he's not alive anymore, so you know, but if he knew your name, you know, would that be a big deal? And to recognize the God who created everything not only knows you by name, he knows every thought you've ever had. Like if... <laughs> If we were in church and had thought bubbles, I always thought that'd be a bad idea for me because I'd be like, really? I thought it was a good point. I don't know, right? Think you could do better? We'll go, right? Uh, or bacon, you know. I always say Bill's got bacon. It just says bacon on top of his. But the truth is the God who knows every thought you ever had still absolutely loves you. And it... It really, when you read this story, you need to, I want you to have just a touch of background I didn't give to them last night, which is this. In, in the Jewish community, they didn't even say the name of God. They, they would not write the name of God. They were careful about it. And then Jesus comes and not only changes the whole paradigm, he says, we call him Abba, which is like daddy. I mean, not only do we call him God, it's informal. And so... When he's sitting with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he's, he's telling them the story of the lost coin and he's telling them the story of the lost sheep and then he's telling them this story of the lost son, he's demonstrating that God doesn't just care about people who seem to have it all together. He cares about all of us. But let me tell you what we do a lot of times. We go through life, and maybe you grew up with a parent who was hard on you, and so they tended to kind of measure everything you did. And uh, uh, I remember uh, one night sitting at the dining room table. My dad owned a construction company, and my brother and I both would work for him in junior high. And that meant in junior high, as little scrawny kids, we were rolling wheelbarrows full of concrete because my dad didn't want to spend the money on a concrete pump. He thought... I got two teenagers, they're the concrete pump I need for $5 an hour, and we would roll wheelbarrows full of concrete, and I can remember sitting at the dinner, dinner table, and my dad looking at me and saying, you work harder than your brother who was sitting here. What was he doing? If you work hard, and if you work harder than other people, 
if you sweat more than other people, if you do more than others, then guess what? You in my book measure up. And guess what? He doesn't work quite as hard. He doesn't measure up to you. Now, he didn't mean to do that. I know that he didn't mean to. He probably thought he was motivating us or, or something, right? But in hindsight, that's wrong, right? But the truth is, if we're not careful, we do that with other people. There's people we look at and we think, well, I'm a little better than they are. I'm a little smarter. A lot of people look at that with me. I have people all the time come to me and here's what they say. They say, Eric, thank you so much for that sermon. Today. I go, oh, really? Yeah, you make me feel so smart. And yet some of you are hard on yourselves. And the reason you're hard on other people is because when you look at the mirror, you look in the mirror and you're always saying, I don't get it right and you don't get it right. And you go around with this chip on your shoulder all the time, judging and aggravating and you're frustrated and you're always a little anxious because it seems like nobody measures up to your standards, even you. And Jesus knew that about the Pharisees. He knew that the Pharisees publicly and in front of people looked really spiritual. They had their act together. They were the thirst and howls of the early church. Lovey, right? You should be more like me. And yet he knew that behind closed doors they had the same thought problems. The same habit problems. The same home problems. The same kids problems that other People had. So we're going to talk today about truths, about worth, worth and God's love. By the way, here's what I know. Any of you know a friend who's critical and hard on everybody? Don't you just love spending time with them? If you're hard on yourself, you might be hard to spend time with. Just so you know. So today I want to look at this idea of the prodigal and his brother because they both thought the father, talking about the heavenly father, measured in different ways. The, the prodigal son thought, I'm not going to measure up. I'm not going to be welcome home. And his brother thought, I'm the hardest worker. I do the most around here. I deserve what I have. And they were both wrong. The truth is that you and I are significant because of God's love for us, but we need to find the truth about God from Scripture and our experience of love. So here we go. Number one, we often feel we have to earn God's love. So let's kick off the story here, Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 20. By the way, one of the most popular uh, stories in Scripture, uh, uh, written by, or drawn by quite a few artists, uh, referred to by Shakespeare even. Um, and people all relate to this story. Now, here's the danger. We all think we're the prodigal son. None of us think we're the older brother. But we're both. And I'll get to that in a minute. When he came to his senses, so you remember the brother runs off, he gives wild living, it says. He's feeding the pigs. And by the way, if you've ever been around pigs, he's now slopping the pigs. He's, he's looking at the pea pods and going, that looks delicious. And as soon as he says that, he goes, oh, no. Number one, I'm Jewish. I shouldn't be with pigs. Number two, now I want what they're eating. And by the way, if you haven't been around pigs, pigs stink. Pig food stinks worse. It's the worst smell. If you've had a rotten bird feeder, that's just a touch of how bad pigs smell. Sorry to put that on you. So the brother comes to his senses. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out, go back to my father and say to him. Now listen to this whole speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And then he says this. I am no longer measuring up. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now, I would love to tell you that it's only the Pharisees who act like this. Years ago, I worked at a church. Um, I did maintenance at a church because I was just trying to make ends meet. So I worked at Quincy's at night. I did maintenance at this church during the day. And when I could, I'd also substitute teach. So I was doing all three things, just 
making a way in the world today takes everything you got, you know. And so I was doing, by the way, thank you for recognizing 80s archaic references. There's kids here who are like, why did everybody laugh? That's stupid. Okay. So anyway, he says, uh, so this one guy, I walk into his office to get his trash, he's a pastor at the church, and I, one of the pastors, and I, I get his trash and I start to walk out and he goes, Eric, Eric, wait just a second. And I said, oh, he said, God told me to tell you something. I thought, wow, God told him something to tell me. By the way, can I, can I give you a list of little high insight? If people say that, don't necessarily think that what they're going to say next is from God. Here's what he said. Let me tell you what God told me. He got real still, real quiet, looked at me for a minute. The awkward silence that people have. He goes, God told me to tell you that you're a pest. I said, what? He said, God told me to tell you that you're a pest. I go, what does that mean? He goes, I don't know, but that's what God told me to tell you. So I punched him in the face. No, I'm just kidding. So, of course, I respected this person. And I'm thinking, why would God tell me that I'm a pest? And I was trying to figure that out. And here's what I realized. You ready? He thought I was a pest. By the way, the guy was a jerk. Got fired not too long after that, just so you know. Just made me feel better anyway, right? Truth was, that wasn't God saying that. But it definitely hurt my feelings, right? How would you feel if somebody told you that? Right? And it makes you mad even hearing that somebody said that to me. By the way, I didn't make up that story. I'd love to tell you I made that up, but I can tell you who the guy is. If you want to know later, come see me. <laughs> Bill, I know you're asking me later. I'm, 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 you know him too. Bill's like, I know who it was. Now, here's the truth. You ready? When I told you that, I heard out loud, many of you went, Ooh! right? Some of you talk that way to yourself all the time. Did you hear me? Some of you make a mistake and you say, idiot, jerk, can't believe you did that, fool. And you talk to yourself worse than that. And yet, as we look at this son, he's saying, God doesn't want anything to do with me. But I'm just going to beg to maybe, maybe, you know, I could just stay out in the servant quarters where it's miserable, but not as miserable as here. Maybe I'll just stay on the outskirts thinking that's all the relationship I can have with God. Because here's what he thinks. God puts up with me. Do you ever feel like God puts up with you? That's not God. That's you or somebody told you that. That's not God. And the truth is, as much as you say, well, Eric, you are a pest sometimes, maybe, or you say, gosh, I can't believe somebody would say that to you. Hey, do you realize God in heaven sees what you're saying to yourself? And he's as outraged as you are about what somebody said to me when you say it to you? You are dearly loved. You are cared about. You have a father in heaven who absolutely adores you. Listen, he knows not just what you do, but every thought you ever had. And he still likes you. I mean, that really bad thought you had, I-95, left lane, guy won't move, those thoughts, bumper cars, you know, everything. He knows that thought, and yet he says, I absolutely adore you. Here's your first question. Do you ever feel you have to earn God's love? Listen to what it says in Ephesians. Paul said this. I love this. He says, he prays that, us, that we, being rooted and established with love, would have power together with the Lord's holy people. Listen to this. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What if you began, listen, if you don't get anything outside of this sermon and you want to take a nap, fine. Harry, I know you're tired, okay? So, so here's the deal. If you're here, all, I want you to get one thing today. God absolutely loves you. But Eric, I'm messed up. Yeah, he knows that. He, he, listen, you ready for this? The days you think you're not messed up, he still knows you're messed up. Like you're there right now going, well, I kind of got my act together today. And God's like, mm -mm. nope, 
still love you just as much. When you become a Christian, he doesn't give you a list. Well, get this straight and then I'll love you. He absolutely loves you, which is crazy because I know me. There's a lot of times I'm unlovable. And you are too. Congratulations. And yet he still loves it. That's how great God's love is. And if we could just grasp a piece of that. Listen to what Brendan Manning said. I love this. My deepest awareness of myself is that I'm deeply loved by Jesus Christ. I have nothing to earn it or deserve it. Number two, God loves us more than we know. Do you know, we have a wrong perspective of ourselves, right? We, we see ourselves. Some of us think we're a little better than everybody else at times. I mean, not everybody, but there's a few people, right? We're a little better than them. That person made some bad choices. And I'm related to them, so I know that I'm better. And then sometimes we go, I'm nothing. God knows all that. See, I, I've never really thought about my height. I know that sounds weird to you guys, but I just never have. Except for when my, older, my younger brother, who's taller than me, will come and go, Oh, he's taller than you. Then I punch him in the face. But um, all right, so not really. Not really. I just secretly talk behind his back. Um, so, in church. Uh, so, I'm in Taiwan. We're going to adopt Jenna. And we go to the market. And I'm walking through the market. And I realize I can see over everyone. <laughs> this must be how Marcus feels all the time. I was walking through and I'm like, I can see way over there. And over there. And then some Americans came and surrounded me, and I was like, get out of here! <laughs> Feeling so tall. Here's the thing we often feel about ourselves by who we're comparing ourselves to. We evaluate our righteousness not based on the righteousness of God or not whether we do. We, we evaluate it based on who's around us, and I'm a little better than them, so I guess I'm all right. By the way, I was no taller when I got home from Taiwan. Not a, not a single bit. He went to a chiropractor, didn't help, right? The truth is, you know, we get around people and we think, well, I'm a little better than them, and so we feel better. Or the opposite, we get around somebody who seems to have their act together and we feel like, man, I wish I could be like that. And so this prodigal son comes home and he's going to give a speech to his dad about being a servant, and here's what happens. While he was still a long way off, what happened? His father saw him. Listen to this next part. See, we don't pay a lot of attention. Was filled with compassion for him. Do you realize that God's filled with compassion for you? Even on your worst day. Even when you blew it, the worst way you could blow it. You did the worst thing you could do. When you come home, he's filled with compassion. And then it continues. He ran to his son. Jewish men were not supposed to run. That was considered uh, uh, irreverent or, or considered beneath you. You weren't supposed to run. When, when uh, the wee little man, Zacchaeus, ran, that was considered immature. You didn't do that. But the father runs. Why? Because his passion, his compassion overtook him. And he ran to him. And then it says, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And this is the idea that he just continually kissed him. Like, oh, so glad you're here. So the son does what he planned on doing. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And remember the next part of his speech said, make me your servant. But as soon as he went to say that next sentence, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Did he deserve the best robe? No. What had he done so far? He just came home. Did he measure up? Did the father say, so what have you been up to? No, that's not how it started. He said, bring the best robe. And then he continued. And put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Now, a ring back then was, was in some cultures like a, uh, uh, a credit card. You could take the, the family ring and go into the market and charge it to your family account. Wouldn't that be awesome? You come home and your parents go, here's my gas card. And here's the Visa. And here's the Discover card. And here's the, right? Ring on his finger. What else is he saying? You're part of the family. And if it was an Italian father, what did he say? Part of the family. Right? 
bring the best robe, ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. Why sandals? Because servants didn't have shoes. It kept them from running away. They would, they would be barefoot. The, the sign of service was being barefoot. So he said, you're no longer a servant. Put the sandals on his feet. And then he says this, bring T-bone steaks. No, no, every kind of steak. What's your favorite steak? Tell me what your favorite steak is. Ribeye, porterhouse, tenderloin. What, what? Just steak. <laughs> steak. What's the cheapest, best one? Free one. Woo! That's what he gets. But every kind of steak, he says, hey, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Why? For the son of mine is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. You ever disappointed with yourself? I said something this week just thoughtlessly, and as soon as I said it, it was one of those oh no moments where you can't fix it. You ever have one of those? And, and then what do you do? You beat yourself up for a few hours. can't believe I did that. Imagine this son coming home. He's getting ready to give a speech. Hey, just make me a servant. I don't deserve anything. And the father says, give him everything anyway. Imagine how the son feels. And yet so many times we're so hard on ourselves. This is what it says in 1 John 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know Him. So what is He saying? God has lavished His love on us. It's undeserved. It's unfair. By the way, whenever somebody says, grace is so unfair. Right. For you and me. Do you accept God's love and forgiveness? See, most of us grew up in homes like I did, where if I spilled a drink, my dad said, well, that's what Eric would do. And so you start to think, well, I'm dumb in this area, apparently. All of us had somebody like that, whether it was a coach or a teacher or somebody in your house. And we tend to relate God to that and think that God's doing the same thing to us, but he's not. He absolutely loves us, and it's beyond anything that you deserve. And here's the deal about repentance. People say, well, Eric, you've got to talk about repentance because that, you, know, you can't just do this if he didn't come home. Here's the deal. When we recognize how much God loves and cares about us, then we want to do what he calls us to do. You know that person that's critical? kind of a jerk. Do you think, I just can't wait for the next time I get to talk to them? No, you're thinking, how can I avoid them the next time I'm in that room? I mean, are they going to be at Thanksgiving this year? It's only January. Yeah, I'm already thinking about it. <laughs> when you get near God and His presence and you realize how much He loves you, it's His kindness, the Bible says, that leads us to repentance. It's how much we recognize He loves us. Brenda Manning says this, we should be astonished at the goodness of God, shun, uh, stunned that he would bother to call us by name. Our mouths wide open at his love, bewildered that at this very moment we are standing on holy ground. Even if you don't feel close to God, God's close to you. God's paying attention to you. God knows you by name. Mr. Rogers might know your name, but who cares? God knows you by name. He knows everything you're dealing with. He knows your struggles. He knows why you're having those struggles. Somebody in their 50s came to me and said, you know, all this stuff I'm learning, why couldn't I have learned it earlier? And here's what I always say. Oh, such an incredible answer from a genius. Oh, oh. But God already knew. God knows all the reasons. There's going to be things that you don't fix before you get to heaven. You realize that, right? And he knows that. Number three, God's grace and love, if we're honest, confuses us. I don't care how great a theologian is. <laughs> I've got friends who would listen to this sermon and be like, well, Eric, you know, point two, I think this is where you need to fix it. And I go, maybe. Eric, you don't really understand God's love. <laughs> exactly. And neither do you. The brother thinks that, so you got the prodigal who thinks, I need to earn it, and you have the brother who says, I have earned it. And that's where we pick up next. 
Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard MC Hammer. Can't touch this. And dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother was excited that his brother was home. Oh, I'm so glad. I've missed him so much. Nay, nay. He became angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Look, says the younger son, all these years, or older son, I've been slaving for you. Do you hear his attitude? I serve you because I have to. I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed you, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And the story stops. And we don't know what the brother does. Because Jesus is sitting with religious leaders who are saying, why do you care about tax collectors and sinners? Why don't you care more about us? We're the ones who've had our act together for so long. I mean, we obey all the law. I mean, maybe we don't love people, and maybe we send our parents away and say that they're gods. But other than that, we, right? Because they thought that they had their act together. And Jesus is looking at them and going, why don't you care about people? Yesterday afternoon, I got just a taste of what God feels like sometimes. I was driving home after visiting the hospital. I got near my house, and on my street, there was an old black dog kind of hunched over on the side of the road, kind of walking home, gray nose, old, obviously an old dog. And I went into the house, and then you know what overtook me. It's too cold for that old dog. So I went back out. The dog wasn't on the street. I thought, oh, no. And then I looked around. He was in my yard. So I texted Kristen. I said, there's a dog in our yard. I texted three or four neighbors. Do you know who this dog is? None of the neighbors knew who the dog was. I went and got a bowl of water, put it in front of the dog. I was afraid the dog might eat me, you know. So, but uh, Another neighbor comes by and I go, I don't know what to do. Do you know who the dog is? No, we don't know who the dog is. The dog every once in a while would go, oh. I thought, He's, he wants to go home, but I don't know where home is for you. So a neighbor came by. I said, oh, I hate to call animal control because they'll put this dog down this dog's old said so i'd like him to find his way home so i posted anybody know this dog on next door or whatever it is nobody all of a sudden i'm looking at the dog the dog oh i hear <whistles> so i i went and followed the whistle i said hey you looking for a black dog? Which is kind of a dumb question at that point. But She said, yeah. He ran off. We don't know where he went. She went. I said, right here. Come here. And she came up. And that dog rolled over on its back. Mama. Right? She picked that dog up and carried it home. She said, she's not walking too well anymore. But I'm going to take her home. I almost cried over a stupid dog that I don't know. And the reason I tell you that is this. Imagine how much God loves that person that you know that is far from him. Imagine how much God wants to see them come home. And he knows that they're just in the street just trying to make it. And he's saying, if you just come home, it's safe. And they're crying out for something and they don't even know what. And God loves them so much. So I want to encourage you. First of all, 
Make sure you receive God's love in your life. That you understand what it means that God absolutely loves you. Because here's the deal. If you don't recognize God's love for you, you'll be hard on other people all the time. But when you recognize His love, you can give people grace, even jerks. Maybe not driving, i got to work on that. But you can give people grace. And then the second thing I want you to recognize is there's somebody who needs to find their way home and they don't think God wants them. And maybe you're just the person to say God loves you right where you are and wants you to come home. So today I would say to you, we're going to pass the offering plate in a minute and you're going to hear a new song. After the service, if you want to talk to me about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to Christ, to say, Jesus, I just want to come home, you can do that today. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you've got somebody that you quit praying for because they've aggravated you so much. You said, I'm not praying for them anymore. But let's begin praying for them. Ask God to help you love the unlovable. You can even love people that don't like you. Did you know that? Say, God, would you help me? Help me to love the people around me the way you do. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time today. I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, I pray for this one the one that's here today who so often condemns themselves, Lord, that today they would know that you absolutely love them right where they are. Father, for that one that's struggling with discouragement or depression, that they would know your love. For that one that's struggling with a sin habit, that they would know you love them, that you'll walk them through it. And Father, I pray too for our friends, our family members who are far from you. Help us to help them find their way home. In Jesus' name.